Amen. What a great prayer we've just sung this morning. Well, I invite you to open your Bibles to Genesis 37 this morning. And no, there is not a typo in the bulletin. We are going to cover Genesis chapters 37 to 50 today. (laughs) I know uh, that's not what we're used to. Typically, I work through one single passage of Scripture at a time. But today, we're doing a big picture flyover of the life of Joseph. And we're going to do that to set the stage for a new series next week, starting in the book of Exodus. But we need to set the stage, so uh, we'll get to that in a minute here, but let's, as you're turning to Genesis 37, let's ask for the Lord's help this morning. Father, we thank you this morning that you do speak through your word, Holy Spirit. We thank you this morning that the word of God in our hands is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is without error that it's authoritative and it's sufficient for us, for life and practice. Lord, this morning as we come to your word, we want to bow humbly, Lord. We want to have hearts of reverence. We want to have hearts of humility, teachable hearts. So, Holy Spirit, come and prepare our hearts and our minds to receive from you today. Lord, I ask specifically this morning that you would make me a servant in your hands today. My mind and my heart would be filled with your spirit and and governed by your spirit such that you work through me as your vessel to serve your people, to strengthen their faith, to give them eyes to see that you are the God who reigns in all things. So Lord, meet us now in these moments, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. A moment ago, we are setting the stage for a new series in the book of Exodus starting next week. However, Exodus chapter 1 is not the beginning of the story of the Exodus. It's actually the, the continuation of a much longer story in which God is working to create a people for himself through which he will display his glory to the world. The story actually begins back in Genesis chapter 1 where God creates mankind. And guess what he does? He creates mankind for himself, right? People in his image, he creates us to know him, to love him, to serve him, and to find our satisfaction in him. We were made for God. We were not made for ourselves. We were made for God's plans and God's purposes, not just our own. And even when the human race rebelled against God, his plans were not thwarted. God knew exactly what would take place. And he was working through it all to develop his perfect plan of redemption for us to display his glory. Well, this plan to establish a people for himself takes more specific shape in Genesis chapter 12 when God called a single person by the name of Abraham to follow him. God promised Abraham that he would bless him and make his descendants into a great nation through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed someday. The first fulfillment of this blessing came when God opened the barren womb of Sarah, Abraham's wife, and gave them a child by the name of Isaac. Isaac then had a son by the name of Jacob, whose name was changed by God to Israel. And then Jacob had 12 sons, and the last 13 chapters of Genesis tell the story of these 13 sons of Jacob and uh, with a special focus on Joseph, his son Joseph, who would be an instrument in God's hand to advance God's purposes of establishing a people for himself who would become a blessing to the nations through whom God would display his glory. Well, the book of Exodus opens with Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a family now of 70 people, living as slaves in the land of Egypt. You think, well, wait, wait, aren't they supposed to be in the promised land in Canaan? Well, they were, but that's that's why we're going to review these last chapters of Genesis this morning to find out why the book of Exodus begins in Egypt with not 70 persons, but a great multitude that has grown out of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So this morning, we're going to do this flyover. We're going to We're going to do a a, a big survey of the life of Joseph as background to the book of Exodus. 
And what I want us to begin to see this morning is not only how God is working already to preserve and to create and establish a people for himself, but I also want us to see this morning how God is advancing his, his purposes and accomplishing his purposes by his providence even through mysterious workings that we could never understand or guess what God was doing in the moment. So as we dive into this overview of Joseph's life, let me encourage you to keep three biblical principles in mind. Okay, Here's the first one. God's purposes and plan will not be thwarted by man's sin or Satan's rebellion. There's a lot of sin (laughs) disrupting this world today. Satan has his role in all of that, but ultimately, none of those things can thwart God's ultimate purpose or plan. And we, of course, one of our favorite verses we see this in is Job 42, 2, where Job himself, through all of his adversity, finally said, I know, Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's the first principle. The second thing I want us to be watching for in this study is that Any attempts to undermine God's plan and God's purpose will be proven foolish and vain and only result in advancing His purposes in the end. My favorite verse that captures this concept comes from the little book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 9, where the prophet writes, Whatever you devise against the Lord, He will make a complete end of it. The final result of any of our plans that go go contrary to the will of God will end in vanity and corruption, destruction, ruin. Here's the third principle we're going to watch for this morning. We would be wise to walk in the fear of the Lord, to walk in the favor of the Lord, by guarding our hearts against any evil that would put us in opposition to God's sovereign plan again job 28 28 the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding and the writer of proverbs with these kinds of concepts in mind goes on to say guard your heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life guard your heart because god is on his throne God is good, but God is holy. God's will and purpose will be, will be accomplished because God is sovereign. And if you live your life in such a way that you're contrary to the will and the purpose and the ways of God, it will lead to ruin and suffering in your life. But if you walk in the fear of the Lord and walk in the favor of God, you can be a part of what God is doing in this world for good. Well, let's see how these truths are illustrated in the life of Joseph We're going to begin reading this morning in uh, Genesis 37, the first 11 verses. So let's begin this story of the life of Joseph. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Billah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. And he made him a robe of many colors. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. And they could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he had told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said behold i have dreamed another dream behold the sun the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me when he had told it to his father and to his brothers his father rebuked him and said to him what is this dream that you have dreamed shall i and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you 
But his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the same in mind. So what's just happened here in these 11 verses? Well, Joseph is his father's favorite son. Jacob is not at all uh, discreet about his favoritism toward Joseph. He makes him a special coat of many colors, which only fuels the jealousy of his brothers toward him. Not only is Joseph favored by his father, but now we begin to see that Joseph is going to have the favor of God. This shows up in these dreams that Joseph is having. However, as a 17-year-old, Joseph lacked some discretion, didn't he? (laughs) And he openly tells his brothers about his dreams, which only fueled their bitter jealousy toward him. Then one day, Jacob sends Joseph, who, by the way, he's at home with dad, while the other brothers are out working in the field, right? He sends Joseph out to check on his brothers out as they're tending their flocks. And we're going to pick up the story now in verse 18. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. So you see now how deep this this bitterness goes, this bitter jealousy? All right. Verse 19, they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him. Reuben said this, that he might rescue him out of their hands and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty. There was no water in it. When they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let our hand uh, be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. Excuse me, let not our hand be upon him. And his brothers listened to them. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they, they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. That's an important clue in our text. Now we know how Joseph is going to get there ahead of his family. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and re- returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. Direct lie. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has destroyed him. Joseph is without without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons, all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I should go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. All right, so now we know how Joseph gets to Egypt, right? Um, he's betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. Now we're going to turn over to chapter 39, and we're going to pick up the story here uh, with verse 1. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, and the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had had bought him from the Ishmaelites, whom he had brought down, uh, excuse me, who had brought him down there. So notice what's happening here. This guy that, that buys Joseph, as a servant, is a high officer under Pharaoh. He's in control of the, he's the captain of the guard, and so he's a prominent official. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. And so Joseph found favor in his sight. 
and attended to him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for the sake of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. And so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Well, this is pretty remarkable, isn't it? I mean, Joseph ends up being sold as a servant to a prominent Egyptian officer. And it's hard to imagine, just don't, don't let the story get too far ahead on you right now. Just, it's hard to imagine what Joseph must have been going through. Think about the emotional journey that he would have been on. He's been trafficked to a foreign country, sold into slavery, probably never expecting to see his family again, and yet, we're told, in the midst of his adversity, God was with him. God was with him. In fact, God blesses Joseph so much and gives him so much favor and success that Potiphar, his master, puts him in charge of everything that he's got. Potiphar recognizes this guy has something special. He's got unique skill. Uh, Probably recognized that Joseph's God, whoever that was, must have smiled on him, and and he was getting the benefit of it. Now, now, trouble is brewing, however, for Joseph. So let's pick up in verse 6. Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Good-looking guy. Robust, strong, handsome, verse 7. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he's put everything he has in my charge. He's not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of the household and said to them, See, he's brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until her master, his master came home. She told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought among us came in to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. So God's blessing and God's favor in Joseph's life did not make him immune to temptation, did it? Potiphar's wife is attracted to Joseph and pursues him, but Joseph refuses that's a strong word here he refuses her advances and his greatest concern was was doing what was right in the eyes of the lord notice here that joseph feared god he feared the lord we want to we know from verse 9 that joseph was not willing to betray his integrity to his master but more importantly he he recognized it would have been a great sin to sin against god in this way And yet Joseph's obedience to God proved costly. Chapter 39, verse 19. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. Of course, he's going to believe his wife, right? Verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. Remember, he's the captain of the guard. He could choose what cell Joseph is going to go to. Places him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Verse 21, but 
the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it successful. Wow. First appearances, this seems to be yet another major setback for Joseph. First he was sold into slavery. Now he is falsely accused and imprisoned for being a man of integrity. And yet, is this a setback? Or is this a stepping stone? Is it an opportunity for God to work in Joseph's life? Notice here, Joseph didn't go to Egypt alone. And now he didn't go to prison alone either. God was with him. Now, I'm sure there were times, many times probably, when Joseph felt very alone. Probably wondered, what is God doing? Why is God allowing this this course uh, in my life? Yet God was faithful to him. Notice it says God showed steadfast love, covenant faithful love to Joseph. Continued to give Joseph favor, and that favor was manifested in Joseph's integrity again. The keeper of the prison soon discovered that Joseph didn't need to be supervised. He could be trusted. Notice here that Joseph was a man of consistent character, whether he was overseeing Potiphar's house, which was kind of a prestigious role for a servant, or whether he was in prison. Joseph's character did not change. Don't miss the key, though, to Joseph's success in the end of verse 23. The Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it successful. I highlighted in my Bible, uh, or underlined in red four times, we're told in this chapter, the Lord was with him, the Lord was with him, the Lord was with him, the Lord was with him. And in being with him, he was giving him favor and success. Now, in the interest of time, Let me uh, summarize what happens in chapters 40 and 41, okay? While Joseph was in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and his chief baker (laughs) did something stupid that offended the the king, all right? So they both get thrown into prison, so now they're in prison with Joseph. But one night, they both have a troubling dream, the same night. They both have a troubling dream, and they can't understand it. But God enabled Joseph to interpret both of these men's dreams, there's actually some kind of humor in the, in the passage as it tells the story because he tells the story first about the cupbearer and gives the answer to his dream. Well, this dream means that in three days you're going to be released from prison and restored to your position with the king. And that gave the second guy confidence to ask Joseph for a, an interpretation of his dream. He said, well, in three days you're going to be lifted up too and you're going to lob your head off. And that's exactly what happens. Three days later, the cupbearer is let out of prison and restored his position and the baker is put to death. Well, uh, when the, when the cupbearer leaves the prison, Joseph says to him, Hey, when, when you get back into the presence of Pharaoh, remember me. Put in a good word for me. Joseph knows he's in prison innocently. But as soon as the cupbearer gets back, he forgets all about Joseph, right? <laughs> he's not going to bring up any of that stuff, right? So he forgets about Joseph. Two years later, this is now chapter 41, two years later, Pharaoh had a troubling dream that none of his his magicians could interpret. So now Pharaoh is the guy who can't sleep at night, right? And this prompted the cupbearer to remember Joseph and how God enabled him to tell dreams or interpret dreams correctly. And so Pharaoh summoned Joseph to explain the meaning of his dreams. Interesting dream. He sees seven plump cows come up out of the Nile River. And then seven skinny, ugly cows come up out of the Nile River and they eat up the seven plump cows, but they don't look any better or any fatter after they, eat, after they eat the seven cows. And then he has another dream. He dreams of seven ears of corn that withered and sprouted and were swallowed up by seven good ears of corn. Wait, what, does that, what does that possibly mean, right? Well, Joseph correctly interpreted the dream to mean that there would be seven years of 
abundance, great abundance in Egypt, followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph went on to urge the king to appoint someone to store up one-fifth of all of their crops for seven years during that time of abundance so they would have enough grain to be proportioned out during the seven years of famine. All right. Now, Pharaoh's pretty impressed with Joseph at this point. So let's turn to chapter 41, and let's see his response in verse 37. Chapter 41, verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, in whom the sp- is the Spirit of God? Like, where else can we find a guy who can tell us things like Joseph is telling us? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. Verse 42. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. Wow, this story just gets more and more amazing the further we go, right? Once again, God has blessed Joseph with tremendous favor, this time with favor in the eyes of Pharaoh. When, when, the king, when the king, when Pharaoh gives Joseph his signet ring, he's giving him authority over the entire kingdom of Egypt. The only person who can say no to Joseph is the king himself. That's incredible. That's massive. Now, don't miss the big picture here. What have we seen so far? For 13 years, Joseph has been going through ups and downs, right? (laughs) Experiencing apparent setbacks in, in, in his life that God has been using as stepping stones to work in Joseph's life, to get him where he wants him to be, to give him experience as a leader, to make him an instrument in the hand of God that in the end will save many people. God has used adversity in Joseph's life to display his mercy to many. Don't miss this. God often uses adversity to display his mercy. Now consider God's providence in all these events. This is just remarkable. Let's just just work our way backward through Joseph's life, okay? Would Joseph have been available to interpret Pharaoh's dreams had he not been in prison where he met the cupbearer? Would he have been in prison had, he not been, uh, had it not been for the false accusations of Potiphar's wife? Would he have been susceptible to Potiphar's wife's schemes had he not been purchased by a, uh, a ser- by the servant, uh, as a servant excuse me, by Potiphar? Would he become the steward of Potiphar's house had he not been carried to Egypt by the Ishmaelites? Would he have been sold as a slave to the Ishmaelites had he not been betrayed by his brothers? Would he have been sold into slavery by his brothers apart from his father's favoritism that provoked his brother's jealousy? Do you see how it's all connected? These are not just random events happening in the life of Joseph. Now, I don't know at what point Joseph could begin to see this, but I'm sure along the way, he's just like, what's happening now? What's going on now? Like, Lord, where are you? God, what are you up to in my life? Through all these experiences that Joseph would never have chosen for himself. God has been working to strengthen Joseph's character, to build his integrity, to strengthen his maturity, to to, um, uh, bolster his confidence to trust God in every situation. Notice here, church, that growth and maturity are often developed in our life through adversity. God uses adversity for our growth, for our benefit, when we are willing to trust God with our lives and with our circumstances. Take note here this morning that just because you go through adversity does not necessarily automatically mean you're going to become mature. It doesn't automatically mean that you're going to grow. There needs to be a response of humility and faith to God in the in the midst of your adversity, and when there is, God is free to work in your life and to shape you into more of the image of Jesus. Now, as we come to Genesis 42, the famine that Joseph predicted has been in full swing for two years, 
And it's so vast and so severe that Joseph's family back in Canaan had also run out of food. But they've heard that Egypt has grain for sale. I mean, the word gets around when people are hungry, right? So Jacob sends his sons to Egypt to buy grain, all except for his son Benjamin, who's now the new favorite. <laughs> Jacob just has to have a favorite son. But you know, so what we've seen so far, those other brothers, it's kind of not surprising, right? <laughs> Who wants to hang out with those guys? They're kind of a roughneck. But Jacob is afraid something will happen to Benjamin, so he keeps him home. Now, when Jacob's sons arrive in Egypt, they bow down before the governor, not knowing it's actually Joseph. Now the irony begins, right? This is the first, uh, take note of this, this is the first of four times now that Joseph's dream as a 17-year-old will be fulfilled as his brothers bow down to him. This is number one of four, okay? But rather than revealing himself to his brothers, you know, Joseph, rec- he figured out what was going on. He recognized them. <laughs> How could he forget those faces? Instead of, rec- instead of revealing himself to his brothers, Joseph decided to test them. So he interrogates them. Where are you from? Who's your father? Do you have any other brothers? Is your father still alive? And they tell him that their father, his fa- that their father is still alive. They have one more brother at home with him. And that their only other brother is dead. A lie they've been promoting for years and years and years and now probably believing themselves. And then Joseph agrees to sell them grain, but there's a catch. <laughs> they have to leave one brother behind, Simeon. Then they need to go home and bring Benjamin back to Joseph to prove that their story is true, it's real. So I've got to tell you before this that um, part of the testing here is that Joseph accused them of being spies in Egypt, right? So now they've got to prove themselves. Now they realize, like, oh, we're not in good terms with this guy. He's the only guy we could buy food from. And now we've got to go back and get this brother that dad doesn't want to let go of. And we got, this is a mess, Right? The brothers, not knowing that Joseph could understand Hebrew, because Joseph has an interpreter standing there doing his work of interpreting, all the while hearing their Hebrew himself and be able to interpret it perfectly. The brothers, not knowing that he could understand Hebrew, turn to one another and acknowledge that this must be God's reckoning for what they did to Joseph. Oh, they have guilty consciences. Look at chapter 42. Chapter 42, verses 21 and 22. Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? He did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. Hebrews don't believe in karma. They believe in divine providence. And guess what? These guys are feeling that conviction, that weight. Now listen, church. You can't outlive and you can't outrun a guilty conscience without getting right with God. Oh, you you might be able to sear your conscience, but a seared conscience is not a cleared conscience. These brothers have lived with this guilt all this weight of guilt all of these years and now they feel like God is bringing it down upon us. Well, as the sacks of grain are being filled for the brothers, Joseph is still testing his brothers to see what kind of character they will have. He he doesn't know if he should trust them or not and so he secretly had their money put back in their grain sacks. Maybe it was part of a setup or maybe Joseph was being gracious, I'm not sure here, to his brothers. But when they got down the roadways and discovered that they still had their money in their grain sacks, <laughs> verse 28 says, their hearts sank and they turned trembling to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? This is terrible. <laughs> Nothing worse can happen. Why? Because, <laughs> first of all, this guy thinks we're spies. He's the only guy we can buy food from. He's got our brother back in prison. We've got to go back and tell a father that 
We have to bring his favorite, bro- his favorite son back down to Pharaoh. We don't know if we can trust this guy. And now our money in our, is in our sacks and it looks like we stole the grain. Oh, it's not a good situation. <laughs> it's interesting here, by the way, that they didn't hurry back. To, they didn't hurry back. They kind of took their time. <laughs> they didn't want to go back and face Pharaoh again. So chapters 43 and 44, finally they run out of food again. And Joseph's brothers returned a second time to Egypt to buy grain because they know it's the only choice they have. They've got to go face this Pharaoh. Or not Pharaoh, but this governor, um, Joseph. They brought back the money that Joseph had put back in their sacks, and they brought along Benjamin, just as he told them to, knowing this was the only possible way to clear their name with the governor of Egypt and get Simeon back. Again, here, they, they bow down to Joseph, and after Joseph invites them to eat with him, this is interesting here, Joseph is, is returning um, good for evil. They eat with Joseph, and after they eat with him, Joseph plants a silver cup in Benjamin's sack of grain. This is, this is really skillful. This is really skillful, right? Then after they're down, a ro- down the road a ways, he sends after them and, and, and accuses them of stealing the silver cup. What is, what is Joseph doing? He, this is a setup to test them, right? How are they going to act? How are they going to respond? And again, the brothers bow before Joseph. I think that's number three now. And when they and to when, when to their surprise they they find the silver cup in Benjamin's sack of all the brothers Benjamin's <laughs> Judah steps forward and offers to take Benjamin's place for the sake of their father. Here's why: because earlier on, when they're having this conversation back and forth with dad about taking Benjamin, he didn't want to let Benjamin go. And he said, "It's the only thing we could do. We have to take Benjamin." And finally, Judah said, "I will be collateral, father." I, I will, if anything, I will make sure nothing happens to Benjamin. And if we find any trouble with, with uh, Egypt, I will stand in his place. And that's what he does. Um, this is um, chapter 44, verse 32. For your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, if, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all of my life. Now, therefore, Please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. Now at this point, when Joseph sees this unfolding before him, he can no longer contain his emotions. And he said to them, I am Joseph. I am your brother, Joseph, (laughs) can you imagine the shock? They don't think he's alive. (laughs) They're talking to one of the most powerful men in the world. And you can imagine the terror that this struck in their hearts. When they realize their brother, whom they had betrayed, sold into slavery, and regarded as dead, is now one of the most powerful men in the world, and they were at his mercy. Whew! Things could not get worse for them now. What would Joseph do? That's the big question. Joseph has the power to do whatever he wants to do. What's he going to do? Would he have mercy on them? <laughs> Would you? Be honest now. Would you? Would he exact vengeance? What we're about to see is one of the most astounding God-centered responses in all of Scripture. Chapter 45 Verse 5, Joseph says, And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me. God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it, was, so it was not you who sent me here, but God. 
Joseph has begun to understand what God has been doing through all these curves and trials and turns and changes and setbacks in his life. God has been setting him up to position him to be an instrument in the hand of God to save not only the Egyptians, but his own family, this family to whom God had promised he would cause them to multiply and make them a blessing to all the earth. Joseph realizes God is working out his plan in a way that no man could ever have anticipated. Now I want you to notice two things about Joseph's response here, okay? Two things. Number one, Joseph recognized that God had a good plan that superseded his brother's evil plan. That's huge. That's, that's real perspective. Joseph is not trapped in just understanding what he sees in his current perspective, in his current circumstances. Joseph is able to step back and see the bigger picture. He knows who God is. He knows that God has a will and a plan and purpose that God will work out. And he's seen God working through adversity in his life to position him to be an instrument in God's hand. So he recognizes that God has a good plan that superseded his brother's plan. And his brothers most certainly have acted sinfully and treacherously against him. He knows that. He gets that more than we do. But God was working by his providence in Joseph's life for good. For good. Joseph had learn to look beyond men, learn to look beyond circumstances to see the hand of God at work in his life. And so three times Joseph says, verse 5, verse 7, and verse 8, three times he says, God sent me. God sent me. This is God's doing. You may have, well, we'll get to that in a moment, chapter 50. You may have meant this for evil, but God was working out his plan. There's a life principle here for us church the only way for us to experience peace in times of adversity or conflict is to trust in the providence of god who reigns sovereignly over the circumstances and people in our lives take that in for a moment take it in the only way to experience peace in times of adversity or conflict is to trust in the providence of god God is sovereign. God is good. God is sovereign. God is good. God is at work. I cannot see it right now. I cannot understand it right now. But I know who God is. And this is what God does. He reigns sovereignly over circumstances and people in my life. The second thing I want you to notice in Joseph's response here is that Joseph overcomes evil with good. This, this must have been hard. I can't, I can't imagine how hard this must have been for Joseph. But what a man of honor. Rather than exacting vengeance, Joseph extends mercy and provides for his brothers and their families. In fact, here's how he does it. He tells them to go and get their father, their families, and all that they have and move down to Egypt so he can take care of them and meet their needs. And that's exactly what they do. He'll make provision for them. And that's how this family, just 70 people at this point, just a family of seven, just a family of 70, you know, <laughs> little Thanksgiving, you know, <laughs> gathering. This is how they find themselves in Egypt, listen, by the hand of God. There's no random circumstances. There's not fate. This is the hand of God. And we're going we're to see next week how God's going to work in some ways that are really hard for us to understand. These, the things that God's people are going to go through over the next 400 years as they develop into a nation of millions, they're going to go through some pretty severe stuff, but it's not apart from the hand of God. There's an important little episode, by the way, that happens in chapter 46 that confirms God's pr hand of providence in all that's to come in the life of Israel. As Jacob and his family are on their way to Egypt, God speaks to Jacob. This is chapter 46, verses 3 and 4. And he says to Jacob, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. Now, why would he be afraid? Well, they're supposed to be in the land of Canaan, the promised land that God has given them, that God has promised them, and now they're leaving because they're starving. And he wants to see Joseph. They're on their way to Egypt, and God says, don't be afraid to go to Egypt. Why? 
for there I will make you into a great nation. Oh, God is still working. God is still fulfilling His plan and His purpose. God has not given up on plan A. There I'll make you into a great nation. I myself will go with you to Egypt. God is promising He'll be with them. And I also will bring you up again out of Egypt. Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Now, just before Jacob dies, he's an old man now, just before he dies, he gives his blessing to Joseph, and in that blessing, he acknowledges that God is the one to be credited with Joseph's perseverance and success. So this is really important right now, because it would be easy for us to walk away today and say, man, Joseph, what a hero, man, what a, wow, what a guy, what a brother, you know, what a stud. Well, he is, he's a good guy, he's a faithful man, but where did Joseph's real success come from? We're going to see it here. Chapter 40, let's see where we at, 49. Chapter 49, verse 22. This is Jacob giving his blessing, speaking his blessing over Joseph. He says, Joseph, verse 22, Joseph is a fruitful bow. A fruitful bow by a, by a spring. In other words, he'll always flourish. His branches run over the wall. <laughs> it's just abundant. Verse 23. The archers bitterly attacked him, shot at him, and harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile, catch this, by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. Verse 25, by the God of your father who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you. Oh, Jacob. Now that he knows what's happened in the life of his son Joseph, he knows there's only one way this could have happened. It's got to be by the hand of God. Hand of God. And he acknowledges that Joseph, for the faithful man that he is, his perseverance is credited to God. His success is credited to God's favor over his life. So Joseph is a good example. Joseph is a great example. But God is the hero in Genesis 37 to 50. After Jacob dies, Joseph's brothers still have a little guilt, a little fear. After Jacob dies, they fear that now, now perhaps he will seek to settle the score with them. <laughs> Let's go to chapter 50, verse 15, and see what they're going to do about it. When Joseph's brothers saw their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. Well, at least they're being truthful now, <laughs> calling it evil. Uh, they're gonna get, uh, it seems to me they're going to get a little bit deceptive here. I'm not sure if, if uh, Jacob gave them this message or not, but verse 16 says, So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. I hmm, wonder if he did. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He's got a tender heart. Have you noticed that? He's been betrayed by his family, sold into slavery, gone to prison without cause. By th- it all started with these guys. And when they come pleading for forgiveness, even if they're using their father in the process, Joseph has a tender heart. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Verse 18, his brothers also came and fell down before him. That's the fourth time now. And said, behold, we are your servants. And Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Am I God? Am I the judge? Am I the one who's going to hold you to account? He sure could act that way. He's got all the power, human power to do it. Verse 20. These are some of the most important words of the Bible when it comes to relationships, hard relationships. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about 
to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I want you to take note of several aspects of Joseph's response. Number one, God has been working out his sovereign plan in Joseph's life even through adversity. Church, say it with me. Even through adversity. Verse 20, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In other words, Joseph's brothers are responsible. Yeah, they're responsible for the evil intent of their hearts and their evil actions against Joseph. But God is the only one who can work out his good and holy purposes even through the sinful actions of other people. And if you don't believe it on the basis of Joseph's life, look to the cross of Jesus Christ where evil men who intended to destroy the Son of God, put Jesus to death on a Roman cross, and God was working through it. Through it, God was working His ultimate good to save all of mankind who would trust in Christ. That's amazing. That's how big our God is. That's how great He is. He can take somebody else's evil intent and work out His good and holy purpose. He will not be thwarted. And they will not ultimately be successful because God raises the dead. Number two, we see in Joseph's response, Joseph demonstrates a heart of forgiveness by forfeiting personal vengeance to leave final justice in the hands of God. Verse 19, am I in God's place? We already saw it, right? What is God's place? What is God's place? God's place is to have the final determination of where mercy should be extended and where judgment, vengeance, and retribution should be exacted. This is why Paul wrote in Romans 12, Never take your own revenge, beloved. Never take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. In other words, You can afford to extend mercy to those who sin against you because I will take care of justice. Leave that to me because we're not going to get it right anyway. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a place for justice in in this world. There is. There is. And yet personal vengeance is always a dangerous proposition because we can so easily get blinded by our own pain and by our own offenses and by our own pride. Be careful. James chapter 2, verse 13. Judgment will be merciless to the one who's shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You may have someone in your life right now who has been really difficult and has created a lot of pain for you and has demonstrated a heart of opposition toward you. And God may have just allowed that situation in your life because he wants you to be the one person, a follower of Jesus, who can display what true mercy looks like. Returning good for evil. Blessing instead. Third thing we're going to see from Joseph's response is that Joseph overcomes evil with good. Verse 21, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and for your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So here, as 1 Peter 3, 9 says, instead of returning evil for evil, for evil Joseph blesses them instead. He calls us to do that in 1 Peter as well, right? So instead of returning evil for evil, he gives blessing instead. And that, that's hard. Because they don't deserve it. And we don't want to give it. And yet, how, what, how do we do that? We, we look to the, the debt of sin that we ourselves have been forgiven and recognize there's infinite grace for us from God so we can afford to give grace to other people, right? Now in all of this, notice that Joseph had, a heart, uh, had the heart of a peacemaker. And notice that not only was Joseph a peacemaker, but he was not the offending party. So often we want to put all the responsibility of peacemaking solely on the party that we think needs to repent. Joseph was the offended party. And he becomes the peacemaker. Joseph had the power to initiate reconciliation, 
by, by extending mercy and forgiveness, by serving and blessing those who wronged him, seeking to do what was right and honorable in the sight of God. That's what mattered most. That's what matters most in your life. It's not how you even the score with another person. It's about doing what's right in the eyes of God. Remember here, Joseph's perspective is ultimately determined not by his brother's sinful actions, but by God's sovereign working. So the heart of a peacemaker is one of faith. The heart of a peacemaker is one of faith that trusts God to work out his sovereign plan in our lives despite the hurts and offenses of other people. So how are we going to apply all this to our life? Well, I think um, Joseph's life here models for us several insights to help us resist bitterness and maintain a tender heart in the midst of conflict and adversity. So what I'm doing now is we're, we're kind of moving a little bit away from the grand story of God, you know, establishing a people for himself, and, and that, that's still happening, but there's some personal application for us here, okay? We're almost done. First thing you want to see, remember that God is with you. Remember. If you're a child of God, God is with you. Just as he was with Joseph in, the, in, in Egypt, just as, this, as he was with Joseph in Potiphar's house and in prison, so the Lord is with you and even working by his providence through your adversity. So ask the Lord, ask the Lord to help you respond with faith, to trust that God is working out his greater good purposes that you cannot see in the moment. Here's the second thing. Recognize that God is working in you so he can work through you. He's with you. He's working in you if you're responsive to him so that he can work through you. Don't become so preoccupied with trying to resist your adversity that you fail to see your trials as incredible opportunities to build your character, to refine your integrity, to advance your maturity, to strengthen your faith in God. That is what God's up to in your trouble. That is what God's up to in your suffering and your adversity. Number three, be a peacemaker. Be quick to forgive. Oh Lord, help me be quick to forgive. Forgiveness is the antibiotic, the antibiotic that overcomes bitterness. Where do you begin? By recounting the massive debt of sin that God has forgiven you when you least deserved it. Here's the last thing. Overcome evil with good. In your personal relationships, instead of coming at others with the law, come to them with the gospel of grace. It's a beautiful picture. I, I, it's one of those phrases in Genesis you wouldn't expect to just like, oh, kind of knock you off your seat, but it did this week. It's a wonderful phrase in Genesis 45, 20, where Joseph, it's, it's just a beautiful picture of the gospel. And there Joseph <laughs> says to his undeserving brothers, here's what he says. Have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. And as I read that this week, I just went, wow, that is the gospel. I mean, I'm an undeserving sinner. And God in his mercy through Christ says to me, if you'll trust me, if you'll trust me, I'll give you all the best that I've got. I'll give you myself. God himself. Because Christ paid the debt of our sin. Wow. Not because we're deserving, but because God is merciful. As we're going to see next week, God was not just working in Joseph's life, he was working out the bigger plan, his bigger plan to preserve and establish a people for himself, a people through whom he will eventually display his glory to all the earth. Yet don't miss the very practical and personal message of hope through, through the life of Joseph. And I had, to, if I had to summarize everything down to one statement today about the practical benefit of these chapters would be this. God is with us in our adversity working mysteriously by his providence to accomplish his good plan and purpose even through those who sin against us.
Wow. Is that the God you know? Is that the God you believe? Is that the God you trust? Is that the God you're going to follow this week? A God who is with you in your adversity? Who's, you know, you know, because the, the Bible says if you know he's working mis- Maybe mysteriously, maybe you can't understand it, but he's working by his sovereign providence to accomplish his good plan and purpose even through those who make life hard for us. All right. I began with three biblical principles, and let me just ask the question this morning if if what we established at the beginning really has worked its way out. Will God's plans and purposes be ultimately thwarted by man's sin? When we see the life of Joseph, no way, right? Not in Joseph's life. We see it also in the cross, right? Will any attempts to undermine God's plan be proven foolish and vain, only resulting in advancing God's purposes in the end? <laughs> yes. You can't outsmart God. You can't out-navigate Him. You can't out-strategize Him. He's won before you started. Number three, would we be wise to walk in the fear of the Lord, in the favor of the Lord, by guarding our hearts against any evil that would put us in opposition to God's sovereign plan? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. So, Father, we pray that you help us do that today. God, we thank you. You're an amazing God, the God we see in the life of Joseph. You're the same God that we serve and worship today, God whose character has never changed, a God who's faithful to his people, a God who's working out his plan and purpose in this messy, troubled world that we can't understand, in this world that uh, makes us shake our heads so many times. <clears throat> and yet you are the sovereign Lord. And one day we will see the final outworking of you displaying your glory and vindic- vindicating those who trust in you. And so, Lord God, today, help us walk by faith. Help us trust you. Help us extend mercy knowing that you're working out a bigger picture, a bigger plan that we can see in the moment. We thank you, Lord God, that when we serve you, you make even our adversity to serve our our good and our blessing and our joy in the end. Father, I pray that in the weeks to come, would you increase our faith by increasing our vision of our great God and make our lives fruitful, like Joseph's. Make our lives a fruitful bow, displaying your mercy and your grace and the beauty of justice wherever you call us to, in any circumstance or any situation. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand.